I said I'd come back to constant comparison. What is it? Um, constant comparison is a way of maintaining a connection between the codes you've got and the data you're looking at. So the codes, the ideas that you're developing about what is happening in the text, what's going on in the text, and the data itself. And every time you get a new passage that appears to be about some topic that you've, you've coded, you compare that with the other data you've coded the same way. Think back to the other cases, the other um, occasions on which that particular code was used, and reread it and think again. Or well, lots of things you might think about. Are, am I being consistent in my application of that code? Um, am I applying it the same way um, so that um, it, it's, you know, it, it, it has some kind of, of, um, of um, core of meaning that's that, that shared between the, the, the coded texts? More interestingly, there are maybe other things going on in the other bits of text that are coded the same way. You can start to think about variations between, not they're actually about the same code, but there may be certain differences, which I'll come back to in a moment, about how you might talk about those different areas of coding. And of course, as you do that, you can begin to think about all the text that is, in a sense, this is a kind of retrieval, effectively. You're retrieving all the text coded the same way and looking at it and saying, well, hang on, what is going on here? What is happening? And you can begin to develop a theory, an, an explanation of what is happening in that text. And in grounded theories, the use of memos is an essential way to do that. So again, I talked in earlier sessions about writing memos. Uh, grounded theorists probably, I think, maybe were, were the earliest to actually talk about using memos as a, as a key part of the approach. And so memo writing in this kind of elaborative theoretical fashion is the way you develop those ideas through the, the constant comparison of, of what you're coding. Okay, just a couple more words about saturation, otherwise known as theoretical saturation as well. Um, the idea is that that constant comparison that's going on, that constant looking back to things coded the same way, comparison with other cases and other settings and so on, would well, eventually exhaust the possibilities. You can't think of any other ways that you could vary things. No, no different kinds of individuals, no different kinds of settings, no different kinds of, of, of situations or events that you could talk about. There is no new relevant data coming up. There are no more variations coming up in the data you've collected. So you've kind of exhausted all the possibilities, if you like, for what you're talking about, for your, your, your data. And what's more, by that stage, your category has well-developed dimensions and properties. I'll, I'll come back in a moment to what, mention what dimensions and properties are, but, but if you like, the, the, um, the possibilities of variation within that code have all been identified and, and covered. And finally, the relationship among the, amongst the categories, the relationship of one code or category with others, is something that, that again, you, you fairly well established. So saturation tends to come near the end of a project, near the end of analysis, because you've done a lot of the work of thinking about those relationships. And for Glazer and Strauss, and also Strauss and Corbin, for grounded theory, if you like, saturation is how you know when to stop. So you go through this kind of repetitive process of coding and looking back to the other codes, comparing things, constant comparison, again and again and again, until eventually the thing is saturated. You feel you can't find any more variations on this. You've got everything you need. Everything's saturated. Then you can stop. Um, now, how do you know that? Well, you get that feeling. Uh, maybe you're just very tired by then. Maybe you're exhausted for having done so much work. Um, but but you know, the sense is, you, if you can't think of any more variations, you think you can reassure yourself that you've, that's it. You can now stop the coding process, or at least the open coding process. Are you in danger of missing that extra idea that could have been there, though, by doing that? You might have just had a lot of dross one day. It's all that was saturated with it all. <laughs> but it's not giving me any new idea. I guess that's a constant danger, and that's, I, that's one of the reasons why I think Glazer and Strauss talk about both constant comparison and saturation because they want you to have the feeling that actually you have done everything you can not to miss those, those crucial things. Um, when they were writing, they were very much. I mean, the social, social sciences was very much dominated in, in the, in the well, 50s and 60s by the kind of empirical quantitative paradigm. And what they were trying to do was show how qualitative analysis could be just as thorough 
as, 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 and just as well-founded and, and, and just as valid as, as those quantitative techniques that used things like you know, representative samples and so on. So this idea of a, of a, of a constant comparison, of a, of a repetitive kind of um, approach to things is to avoid exactly the problem you, you brought up of, of, of missing things. But of course, we're human. <laughs> we can still miss things, even though we've, we've done that. But, but there is some reassurance that you, you know, at least you can think about those kind of things and bring them to mind. Is there a, is there a number of interviews where you normally get saturation? Uh, is that, I read that some say nine, others say thirteen, mm. twenty-six. I don't think there is. It depends on the topic. I think it. I think it. Well, if you think about it, it depends upon a whole variety of factors. The topic certainly, yes, it depends upon that and how you define the the topic you're investigating. How many kinds of variables there can be? How many kind of variations on things there can be? So the more variations there can be, the more different people you might need to get hold of, the more different settings you might need to investigate and so on. That's yeah. one issue. Um, the other is that the nature of the people themselves and, and how you approach what they're doing. Again, you, know, you, you could have a situation in which you're asking fairly straightforward questions, in which case you might expect a smaller sample to give you what you need. But if you go into a, a much more kind of discursive kind of approach, a constructivist kind of approach, which, for example, Sharmaz would, would recommend, you might get a lot more variation just in simply the way people are talking about things. And again, you need to investigate all those possibilities. So a, a, a larger sample might come from there as well. So I don't think there is a simple answer to that, honestly. I remember some years ago, a colleague was, was many, many years ago, a colleague was doing his PhD part-time. And um, he, um, he was doing it by qualitative analysis and wanted to know how, how many people to, to interview. And he went to Anne Oakley's uh, thesis, it was then, um, on housework, I think it was, um, and ha asked how many she, she did. And it turned out, this is a famous sociologist, Anne, Anne Oakley, um, and uh, she did 50 interviews. This was, must have been the mid-60s she was doing her work. Um, that's quite unusual now. I mean, when you look at PhD theses now, and I talk to other, other colleagues about how many, they're doing, how many their students are doing and so on, it's much, much smaller. It's in the 20s and 30s. That kind of, so it, I think over the years, it, it's got easier to do a PhD, you see. <laughs> Sorry? I've seen some recent the other day from Liverpool. 14. Doing, Doing grounded theory with 14. Yes, that is interesting. I, I think that's too few. There are some approaches, some, for example, phonological approaches, where smaller numbers are perfectly acceptable. It's much more intensive, much more concerned with you know, the, the experience of the individual. Uh, and that's fine. Smaller numbers is acceptable. But I think for a grounded theory approach, you'd expect more than that. Um, but maybe less than 50. Um, and it depends, again, you know, it could be a team of you working. Maybe you want to do you know, 100 interviews. I've certainly come across examples of that, over 100 interviews. Um, usually a team of people doing it, not a PhD thesis.